Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Paul Salkin, Chair of the Dean's Advisory Committee on Jewish Studies, and I'd like to welcome to you here on a winter evening for what I know will be a very exciting and challenging discussion. I would like to call on Dr. Michael Higgins, the President of St. Jerome's, to welcome you. Thank you, Paul. As I think I mentioned last year, it's beginning to acquire the reputation of the Irish Studies Program, <laughs> where we start significantly after the time that's supposed to begin. <laughs> but we have an Irish Dean, and, it, and he's here tonight, <laughs> and it makes a wonderful, wonderful, it establishes the tone. A tone that's both hospitable and welcome, and time is largely irrelevant, because tonight's experience, I think, will be a deeply learning one. Welcome to St. Jerome's University and the University of Waterloo. We are the Catholic University federated with UW. And many, many years ago, it's almost apocryphal now, but it's still very much true, uh, Brian Henley, who was then the dean, had come out uh, after having seen um, uh, Schindler's List and uh, observed that something needed to be done at the university. He had conversations with Paul Sacken, and then many years later, we had the Jewish Studies Program. I remember on one occasion shortly after this all began, being uh, in Australia on research, talking to Brendan, uh, Thomas Keneally, who is, of course, the author of uh, Schindler's List. And the conversation wasn't going very well. Um, Keneally is, uh, is a very robust and aggressive Republican, and I'm a royalist. So th this, this wasn't going very far anywhere. So I decided to shift the topic, and I mentioned the fact that Paul Sacken, and particularly Brian Henley, had commented when they were establishing Jewish studies, the special role that Schindler's List played. Well, he was delighted. Not a, delighted enough to uh, f uh, you know, renounce his Republican leadings, but delighted nonetheless. <laughs> and a, in a very important way, we are here at St. Jerome's are especially pleased to be able to host so many of the Jud Jewish uh, program studies, uh, public lectures, and indeed the dinners, because we see ourselves as an integral part of this very important exercise in learning and in reconciliation. So welcome all to tonight's lecture sponsored by the Jewish Studies Program here at St. Jerome's University. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Higgins. It's my pleasure now to call on uh, Professor Jim Diamond, the Joseph and Wolf Lubavik Chair of Jewish Studies at the University of Waterloo, to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Paul. It's uh, very gratifying to see the turnout tonight, despite uh, the weather. Um, before I introduce uh, our speaker tonight, um, who's known to a lot of you, um, I'd like to just say uh, one thing. There, there's, there's a actual commandment in the, in the, uh, in the Old Testament um, and in Jewish law, which is to remember what Amalek did to you. Um, Amalek being kind of the uh, paradigm of evil in the Bible. And remembering in Jewish law doesn't seem simply, is not simply addressed to the mind, but remembering as any commandment in Jewish law is directed towards some concrete act. That is, there must be some concrete performance of remembrance, an act of remembrance. And this, the, 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 the significance of this command never really hit me, actually, uh, until the other day when I was, uh, as I usually do for a lecture, I try to kind of prepare for it, look up some of the material. And I was looking up. Um, I wanted to get the text of the uh, Wansi Protocol, the Wansi Conference, and I was looking it up on the web, um, and sites came up, and I got, the, uh, I got the text, and another site came up, very innocuous-looking site. I pressed, uh, click, uh, click the mouse on it, and up comes a very scholarly-looking article with footnotes and uh, different languages, and the title is the Wansi Conference, An Anatomy of a Fabrication. And um, I, don't, I don't have to tell you what this article was about, half-truths. I actually went to the, went to the bother of, of, of looking up some of the quotes, quotes that, that uh, misquotes, half-quotes, half-truths. And it, it, it hit me 
the full significance of this co command, this divine command, to remember, that is, to remember a concrete act of remembrance, which militates against this kind of thing. Because what this does, what these kinds of sites do, and what this revisionist school does, is in a logical way continue what the Nazis did. That is, the Nazis annihilated the Jews, and now this school doesn't e even allow us the dead, so that it erases the dead. So that, in effect, what this site and what this revisionist school does is that when I look at the picture that my father showed me from when I was a little kid of some of his brothers and sisters out of 10, and only a, a few survived, that I have to say that this picture, I have to wipe out those pictures. I have to wipe out those faces. Of course, they didn't exist. I mean, where were they? So that lectures like the one that we have tonight are actually fulfilling a divine mandate. That is, the mandate to perform concrete acts of remembrance that, that do war, that do battle with the attempts to erase all memories of this evil. So I would like to welcome now uh, Professor Stephen Burke, who is the Florence B. Sherwood Professor of History and Culture at Union College, to enlighten us um, about a very dismal event in, in, in Jewish history and in human history. And I have to say that in Jewish law also, Professor Brick has been with us twice before, and this is his third time. And in Jewish law, we are now obligated to call him in perpetuity. So I'd like you all to welcome Professor Burke <laughs> for tonight's distinguished guest lecture. Thank you, thank you very much. That was a, a magnificent introduction. And Dr. Higgins, thank you very, very much. Thank you all for coming out on a very grim winter evening. I must tell you that someone from your local newspaper called me and very, very bluntly said, are you gonna tell them anything that isn't on the website? <laughs> I didn't look at the website, but Professor Diamond did, and he will be the, the, the judge of that. The second thing is he has made a reference to what is, of course, known in the profession as revisionism. And I'll just give you a quick example of how subtle and how dangerous that type of thing can be. It is my good fortune, and I really is my good fortune, to travel to East Central Europe several times a year. And I take people, among other places, and we go to Auschwitz. And in Auschwitz I, what in German was called the Stammlager, or the main camp, there is an extermination, there is a gas chamber. It is one of the few places in the world where you can actually walk in to a gas chamber. Now, I had seen some, some really good, that is for its type, revisionist film and revisionist writing on the Holocaust. And the revisionists make a big deal out of that particular gas chamber. Because in the gas chamber, there is a place for a bathroom. And the revisionists say, surely this could not have been a gas chamber. Who puts a bathroom in a gas chamber? And they're right. Except what they do not tell you is that in 1943, the gassing of Jews was moved from Auschwitz I, the Stammlager, to Birkenau, which was Auschwitz II. That's where the main gas chambers and crematoria were. The gas chamber in the Stammlager, in Auschwitz I, was turned into a bomb shelter for German soldiers. That's why there was a bathroom there. So the point here is, I must tell you, do not really shrug off Holocaust revisionism. It is a very, very dangerous type of thing. And indeed, with the coming of the web, for those who surf the net, and for those who are uneducated in the area of the Holocaust, there is a real danger there. 
And for those who know about this, for those who are familiar with the Holocaust, it is incumbent upon them always to set the record straight. So once again, I thank you for coming out. And then I begin by telling you that yesterday, January 20th, was the 60th anniversary of one of the great milestones and events in the history of the Holocaust. The Wannsee Conference, which was held on January 20th of 1942. No understanding of the Holocaust can really gloss over this particular event. It is true that we have shifted some of our thinking about Wannsee. It was thought for years after the war that it was at Wannsee on January 20th of 1942 that the decision to murder European Jewry was taken place, or took place. That is not true. That is one of the myths of the Holocaust. We'll talk in a few moments about when that decision was made. There is no consensus on that. But for sure, let the record be straight here, the decision to murder European Jewry did not take place, was not made at Vanze on January 20th of 1942. Nonetheless, what happened at Vanze is of great importance. Any discussion of Vanze, in fact, any discussion of the Holocaust, has to begin with mention of Adolf Hitler and Adolf Hitler's view of the Jews. To say that Adolf Hitler was an anti-Semite is like saying it's cold outside. To use the cliché expression, Adolf Hitler's anti-Semitism was a quantum leap above anything that the world had seen before. One can talk about Christian anti-Judaism, one can talk about economic anti-Semitism, one can talk about the intersection between nationalism and anti-Semitism. Nothing of the prior 2,000 years rivals the anti-Semitism of Adolf Hitler. For Adolf Hitler, the Jews, and I'm quoting here from a 1942 speech, the Jews were the worst evil of all peoples of all time. One prominent Holocaust survivor, Shaul Friedlander, himself a distinguished historian, writes about the fact that Hitler's anti-Semitism was really a redemptive anti-Semitism. By that he means that Hitler not only saw the Jews as responsible for a myriad of ills and evils that had befallen the German people, but that Adolf Hitler in his heart of hearts, as they used to say in the 19th century, was absolutely convinced that the German people could not be free could not survive, could not thrive, unless the Jews disappeared from the face of the earth. That is, again, there was no salvation for the Jew, not conversion to a particular brand of Christianity, not assimilation into the German ma mainstream, not even the abandonment by the Jews of his Judaism. It would have no avail. In the end, the Jews had to simply be eliminated. Within this realm, there was something else that is important, and I suggest that you keep it in mind. I am not a psychologist. I am not a psychiatrist. We do know, however, that there are events in our youth that sometimes shake us to our very core. Suffice it to say, you will not get from me the answer that some historians have wrestled with and have not done a good job in dealing with. And that is, why was Hitler Hitler? What were the factors or the forces that made Hitler an anti-Semite? I cannot answer that, nor will I attempt to answer it. I can tell you what he said and what he did. I cannot tell you, nor can anyone with definitiveness, tell you why he was what he was. But what we can say is that one event really rocked him to his very core. It would never leave him, and it is particularly relevant to our discussion. For those of you that know your history, your World War I history, and your German history, 
you know that in November of 1918, the German army collapsed. The German army, which had been on the offensive for four out of four and a half years during the war, the same German army that was responsible for every technological advance in World War I, that is the submarine, the use of poison gas, the use of the machine gun, and the so-called creeping barrage, the only thing that did not come from the German side was the tank, the Germans who had been on the offensive for four out of four and a half years, probably even more than four years, their army collapsed while still deep in French territory and in control of nearly all of Belgium. For Hitler, who had been gassed during the war and was convalescing in a German hospital, in a military hospital, and for millions of his compatriots, there was only one answer to why the army had collapsed. In German, the expression is the Dolchstoss, the stab in the back. Our gallant soldiers were not defeated on the field of battle. They were stabbed in the back by the communists, the socialists, the Freemasons, and above all, the Jews. The Jews were disproportionately represented in the Communist Party and in the Socialist Party, and within the Masonic movement, the Jews, he argued, along with millions of his compatriots, were responsible. I say this to you, not because it is, of tr is true, it of course is nonsense. The German army collapsed in 1918 because to use the old World War I expression, Germany had shot her bolt. The Allies were too strong. 300,000 American soldiers were arriving in Europe, in France, from December of 1917 on, and 300,000 would arrive each month. The German army was at the end of its tether. That's why the German army collapsed. But for Hitler, the collapse was something that should never, never be allowed to reoccur. And if it was necessary to guarantee that it didn't reoccur by making sure that one settles accounts with the Jews, this, I suggest to you, is an important factor in his thinking. What does Hitler have in mind for the Jews? Here again, there is no consensus. No consensus whatsoever. For those who like the technical terminology, German historiography divides between so-called functionalists and intentionalists. The functionalists argue that Hitler had in mind the emigration of Jews from Germany and German-occupied Europe, that he seriously flirted with the idea of sending them to the French island of Madagascar or indeed to a Polish reservation within and around the city of Lublin. The functionalist school goes on to argue that when all places of emigration were closed off, when in fact pressure from below within the Nazi elite began to argue for in fact extermination, Hitler finally decided upon extermination. That is, it was forced upon him. Not a difficult decision for him to make, since we have seen he was filled with such vituperation against the Jews. The other school is the intentionalist school. That's the school that I belong to. And that is that Hitler, almost from the very moment of his political consciousness in the 1920s, was hell-bent on destroying the Jews. One cannot cite any definitive proof, but I refer you to this idea of redemptive anti-Semitism. If the Jews are responsible through A through Z, then indeed you've got to deal harshly with them. Emigration is not enough because they might revive in another part of the world and again deal havoc to the German people. I also, and the people of the Intentional School, make reference to this very important speech, or a part of a speech, made on January 30th of 1939, before the war begins. I know how much students of history hate dates. I hear it all the time. In fact, I hear it ad nauseum from my students. But unless you have a sense of the chronological flow, you really do not have a sense of the historical flow. The war began on September 1st of 1939. This speech was made seven to eight months before, January 30th of 1939. And at the end of a long harangue against the Allies, against the British and French, and against his opponents, he goes on to say, and I warn the Jews, you brought about World War I, and I warn you, if Jewish financiers and Bolsheviks 
are going to bring about another war, plunging Germany once again into the mire and the muck of warfare. I promise the Jews, it is you who will pay and not the German people. I and others would argue, not definitively, that this gives you an inkling of what is to come. That in the event of war, the Jews will have will be placed in a very, very, to say the least, difficult position. The real difficulties for the Jews begin with Operation Barbarossa. Four o'clock in the morning of June 22nd, 1941, the Germans invade the Soviet Union. Now, for those of you who are the descendants or the children of Holocaust survivors, please do not misconstrue what I am saying. The ghettoization of Jews in Eastern Europe had already taken place. There were individual actions that had taken place against Jews before June of 41. But if we're beginning with Operation Barbarossa, we see mass murder. We say that the first real decision made by Adolf Hitler concerns the Jews of the German-occupied areas of the Soviet Union. But to show you how difficult it is for the historian, because we simply do not have the data, the discussion really pivots around two dates. Does Hitler make the decision and communicate it to the leading authorities of the Third Reich at the end of March of 1941, when he holds a special meeting with the Oberkommand Wehrmacht, that is the generals of the armed forces, and tells them that this is going to be a war that is, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, will be a war unlike any that has been fought before by the German army in all of its history. In a famous statement, he says, the normal rules of warfare will not prevail in the Soviet Union. In other words, Hitler is giving carte blanche to the German army to carry out ferocious attacks upon civilian targets. This is a war against civilizations, a war of civilizations. We are fighting the seed of Judeo-Bolshevik barbarism. Is this when he tells the German high command, as well as leading members of the Nazi party, that it is time to settle accounts with the Jews in the German-occupied areas of the Soviet Union? We do not know. Or is it sometime after June 22nd? We do know, however, that a decision is given. And from the end of June, for the next two years, four special mobile killing squads, Einsatzgruppen A, B, C, and D, will range from the north right down to the Ukraine to the Black Sea, 3,000 men in total, being assisted by several thousand Ukrainian, Latvian, Lithuanian, and Ukrainian auxiliaries will in an 18-month to two-year period murder two million Jewish men, women, and children. Jews in the German-occupied areas of the Soviet Union have the dubious distinction of having the killers brought to them. From elsewhere in Europe, the Jews are brought to the killers. Is Hitler thinking beyond the Jews of the German-occupied areas? There are those who will say, and their proof is, again, fairly convincing but not definitive, that a decision to exterminate all of European Jewry does not come until much later. I don't want to bore you with the decision-making process, but there is some importance to it. On the other hand, what are we to make of a statement by the leader of the Gestapo, deputy head of the SS, and a man who will ultimately become inextricably bound up with the Holocaust, Reinhard Heydrich. It is Heydrich who will tell people that on July 31st of 1941, he is summoned by Hermann Goring, the head of the Luftwaffe, the head of the four-year plan, the man who is the heir apparent to Adolf Hitler, and Goring tells him, you, Heydrich, you prepare for the final solution of the Jews. What does he mean by final solution? Is he talking about ghettoization and deportation? We do not know. We simply do not know. But you can make the argument that he is indeed thinking of about extermination. What are to be we to make of Adolf Eichmann's reply 
to a question at Jer in Jerusalem in 1960, when he is asked, when did you hear for the first time about the extermination of the Jews? And he says, late summer, early autumn of 41. What are we to make of Rudolf Heuss, the first commandant of Auschwitz, who tells at his trial after the war, it is in the summer of 41 that I heard about it. Are these men lying? Are these men really telling the truth, but that Hitler had not yet made the decision? That others like Goring and Himmler had made decisions? I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. In any event, a number of things are taking place in the summer and autumn of 1941. The first is the actions of the Einsatzgruppen. The second is Jews in a town. In English, it's Lodz. In Polish, it's Wódz. This is a Polish city, the Polish Manchester, the great textile and industrial center of Poland. This is not in German-occupied territory. This is in the part of Poland that is directly annexed to Germany. And in November and December of 41, a new extermination camp is built. It is called Chelmno, and Jews by the thousands are being sent to Chelmno, and they are being gassed, and they are being cremated. In the area of Lublin, another extermination camp is being built. This is Belzec. Eventually, at least 600,000 Jews will die. There, this is taking place long before what most historians, or at least somewhat before, the time that most historians today say that Hitler gave the definitive decision. In addition to that, there is another thing that is happening. By this time, the German government, the government of the Third Reich, has begun the process of massive deportation of German Jews to the East. You may not be aware of this, but with everything that has happened, there was still approximately, by the middle of 1941, somewhere between 125,000 and 150,000 Jews still remaining in Germany. Some could not get out. Some believed that it had not been necessary to get out. They had made a mistake. Now they are being deported to the East. And when they get to the East, some interesting things are going to happen. Those that go to Lodz or Wuj are going to be shipped to Chelmno and gassed. Some of those that go to Riga are going to be shot right on the spot. But some of those who go other places are not going to be exterminated. They will live in horrible circumstances in the ghetto, but they will not be murdered. The reason for that is there is no uniform policy. There is a lot of chaos and anarchy in this stage of the war against the Jews. There is even a remarkable letter by a German civilian administrator in one of the occupied areas of Russia who writes to Himmler and says, you're sending me quarter Jews, half Jews, you're sending me highly assimilated Jews, and you're sending me Jews who have served at the front and are wearing the iron cross on their lapels. I cannot kill them. They are not like these Lithuanian and Polish Jewish barbarians. Those people have to die. I am a hard man, this man Kuba says, and I will do what I am told. I know the danger of the Jewish menace, but I will not kill these people unless I get an order from Berlin. In addition to that, a number of very prominent Germans are beginning to intervene in behalf of individual Jews. The most famous intervener was Count Helmuth James von Molke. That's a very famous name in German history. One von Molke had been the first chief of staff of the Prussian army. Another von Molke had been the chief of staff in 1914. When a von Molke talks, some Germans are going to listen. This, of course, is very much similar and reminds one of what is a very famous story told by Heinrich Himmler. It is famous in the historiography of the Holocaust, and it should be mentioned. Himmler once said, these German people are impossible. He's not talking about Jews. He's talking about his fellow Germans. They're absolutely impossible, he says. Why are they impossible? 
Because when I get up and give a speech saying the Jews have done this, the Jews have done that, the Juden sind unser Unglück, the Jews are a misfortune, the place roars, screams, kill the Jews, death to the Jews. The Jews are our misfortune, the scum of humanity. And the people roar, they stamp their feet, they clap their hands, they say, in effect, he would not use this word, give them hell, Reichsmarschall. But then he says, when I come off the podium and walk down there, all of a sudden there are a line of Germans. And the first one says what they all say. Herr Reichsmarschall, a magnificent speech. The Jews are the scum of Germany and they must be destroyed. But Herr Reichsmarschall, my friend Hermann Schwartz served with me in the trenches at the front. He's a good Jew. Can you do something for him? And then the second man comes up and says, Herr Reichsmarschall, the Jews are animals, barbarians, the Fuhrer, and you are right. But this man Goldberg, he's my partner. He's an honest man, a decent man. Can you do something for him? I don't want to exaggerate this. Do not misconstrue what I am saying. If anything, I must tell you, it may come as a shock to some of you, especially the academicians, the fact of the matter is I line up with Professor Goldhagen in most of what he has to say. But the fact again is, here we are in the late summer and the autumn of 41, and there is chaos in the implementation of at least part of the final solution. That is why Reinhard Heydrich, again, the head of the Gestapo, deputy head of the SS, who later will become the protector of Bohemia and Moravia. This is the man who sends out on November 29th of 1941 an invitation to a number of people to come to a special meeting to be held in the suburb of Vanze in a beautiful villa where there will be discussed primarily the issue of what we do with German Jews. Should they be deported? Which among the Jews should be deported? And what, in fact, should be their resolution when they are deported eastwards? That is the original design for the Vanze Conference. The letters go out November 29th. The meeting is scheduled for December 9th of 1941. The meeting is not held. Life or history intrudes. Number one. On December 5th of 1941, to the complete consternation of the German high command and of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin launched a massive counteroffensive around the city of Moscow. This is the first great defeat experienced, bona fide defeat, experienced by the German army in World War II. For those of you that remember your history, you will know that Stalin is able to do this because in the summer of 1941, the Soviet Union had signed a non-aggression treaty with Japan. And Stalin was able to shift over 500,000 Siberian troops to the front outside of Moscow. They are hurled against the Nazis, and the Nazis are forced into a rapid retreat. Now here, again, don't get upset by what I'm about to say. It's a funny way of saying this. It should never be said, but it has to be said. A fair is fair. It is in connection with this battle that we see Hitler at his best. The fact that the retreat does not turn into a rout is because of Hitler. Hitler personally intervenes, threatens German generals with all sorts of punitive, let's say, punishment, all sorts of difficult punishment. And the word goes out that every German soldier is to hold his position. What could have been a catastrophe is a defeat. This, I must also tell you, is the last, from the German perspective, beneficial intervention of Adolf Hitler in the Second World War. As we shall see, he will move from disaster to disaster to disaster. The second thing that happens between November 29th and December 9th is the Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor, the American declaration of war on Japan on December 8th, Hitler's declaration of war against the United States on December 11th, 
and Roosevelt's declaration of war against Germany on December 12th. For those of you that like to speculate in the ifs of history, let me throw this out to you. What would have happened if Adolf Hitler had said on December 11th, addressing the American people over the heads of the American president and his government, in effect saying to them, to the American people, listen, we had nothing to do with Pearl Harbor. This is between you and the Japanese, and the German people want only harmonious relations with the United States of America. There are reasons as to why he did not do that, but I'm suggesting to you that if you like to talk about historical speculation, think about that. And think about something else. The Gallup polling organization had polled the American people on a weekly basis since the Second World War began in September 39 and asked the American people, number one, what was the, what's the major problem, what's the major issue confronting our country? And the answer that the American people gave was keeping the country out of war. The second question was how many Americans, people were asked, want to intervene in the Second World War? On December 1st of 1941, that is a week before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the Gallup polling organization registered the largest percentage of Americans that were prepared to enter World War II. That figure was 20%. In short, Roosevelt had no mandate to enter the war. Had the Japanese not attacked Pearl Harbor, it is unlikely that the country would have entered the Second World War. And again, I raise this issue with Hitler. But for our purposes, what is most significant is Hitler's speech on December 12th of 1941. He calls his 50 closest confidants among the Gauleiters, the party officials within the Third Reich. He invites them to a lunch in his private apartment at the Reich's chancellery. And then he delivers a speech. This is probably, in terms of the Holocaust, the most important speech that he ever gave. We know about the meeting and about the speech from the diary of Joseph Goebbels, himself a fervent Nazi and an even more fervent anti-Semite, and a close, to say close, really does not do justice to it, certainly a devotee of Adolf Hitler. And what does Goebbels tell us that the Fuhrer says? The Fuhrer says, quote, it is time to, quote, clear the decks, end quote, with the Jews. They have brought about the war. The New York Jews in particular have manipulated Roosevelt. They're the ones that have brought about the war. They plunged Germany into despair in World War I. And in fact, they are absolutely impossible. They will destroy us if they can. And we must deal with them, quote, without any compassion and without any pity. In short, this is an invitation to genocide. Hitler well knows that these 50 Gauleiters are not going to keep a secret, that in fact their charge now is to begin the process of manipulating German society in such a way as to support the final solution and indeed to prepare German society and to prepare the underpinning for the extermination of European Jewry. It is no coincidence that five days later, the German Evangelical Church, to its eternal discredit, regional bodies of the German Evangelical Church, the major Lutheran body within the Third Reich, will publicly call for the deportation of all Jews from Germany and the harshest measures, anti-Semitic measures, implemented, implemented all over German-occupied Europe. The German Evangelical Church was very, very well connected. It got the message from December 12th. And so, too, did Reinhard Heydrich. Now the letters go out again. This time, we're going to meet at Wannsee, on January 20th. This time, there's a different agenda. The agenda is not what we do with Mischlingen, Jews of mixed blood in Germany, not what we do with German Jews, 
But what do we do? Now that the Fuhrer has given us the order, what do we do with the Jews of German-occupied Europe? Heydrich has a very specific agenda. The first point on the agenda is to establish the primacy of the SS in general, and himself in particular, as the masters of the final solution. He also wants to transmit to various branches of the bureaucracy the order that has come down from on high from Adolf Hitler. He wants to iron out all difficulties, he wants cooperation, and he wants to test the mettle and the temper of the German bureaucrats, many of whom are not party members or are only nominally party members. He wants to make sure, to use our own cliche expression, that they will sign on. The invitations go out. Fifteen men are present. Several of them are from the SS. Eichmann is there. Heydrich himself is there. One of the leaders of Einsatzgruppe A, a man who is personally responsible for the deaths of tens upon tens of thousands of Jews in Latvia and Lithuania, is, dead, is there. There is also a representative from the Ostministerium, that is a civilian body that governs the eastern territories, some of the eastern territories behind the German army. There are also representatives from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, from the Foreign Office, and from the Justice Department. There are also people there, there's one man in particular, who is there from the general government, that is the Nazi-dominated areas of Poland. I must tell you, and as I was telling someone before the talk, it is a very sobering note, and you should keep this in mind, that out of the 15 men that are there, eight have PhDs. If there ever was proof that intelligence and a high degree of educational achievement is no barrier to murderous activity, it is, I think, testified to by the presence of these men and their behavior at Wannsee and afterwards. The conference begins on January 20th. It only lasts an hour and a half to two hours. It begins with a speech by Heydrich. Heydrich transmits the decision, tells the people there, we are going to murder the Jews of Europe. Doesn't use that language. Eichmann in Jerusalem says, euphemisms we used, and if you read the text, of his speech, that is of Heydrich's speech, you see the euphemisms. Jews do not die, they disappear. Jews are not murdered, they are subject to sanda behandlung, they are subject to special treatment. In the speech, Heydrich says, we will comb Europe from west to east for the Jews. We will ship them to the east, where? Those who are able to work will be worked. And they will work hard, and many of them, if not most of them, will die. Those that do not die will be dealt with accordingly. Because according to Heydrich, by natural selection and survival of the fittest, these are the strongest of the Jews. They must be dealt with, or else they will pose a threat to us. And as a German historian, Gerhard Reitlinger, has put it, you gotta be, he doesn't use this language, but you really have to be out to lunch, not to understand that if Heydrich says, the Jews who will work will work until they drop, and those who survive will be killed, it is implicit in what he is saying that those who cannot work will be killed immediately. That is what is being said at Wannsee. And what happens at Wannsee is that everybody signs on. There is not a voice that opposes what is going to take place. In fact, there is a great deal of enthusiasm voiced by people that Heydrich didn't think would have that enthusiasm. For example, the man by the name of, an appropriate name, Martin Luther, the representative of the German Foreign Office, is zealous in what he demands. We must extend this deportation to Germany's allies. Not only 
in fact, to the countries occupied by Germany. And the representative of the general government demands that when the process of murder takes place, it's the Jews of Poland that are to die first. There is not a single voice of opposition that is directed against what is taking place. The only disagreements that occur, occur at Wannsee over the issue of what you do with the Mischling and those of mixed blood and those Jews who are married to non-Jews who are married to Aryans. Do you deport them? In the end, no decision is reached, and I will tell you parenthetically, nearly all of those Jews who are married to non-Jews and nearly all of those people of mixed blood in Germany will survive the war. But for those who are Jews, qua Jews, who are bona fide Jews according to the Nuremberg racial decrees, who are real Jews, not Michelin or mixed blood, for them, they are going to die. At Wannsee, it is laid out what is going to happen and the bare outlines of how it is going to take place are also laid out. Eichmann will testify in Jerusalem that Heydrich was absolutely ecstatic about what had taken place. He anticipated difficulty from the ministries, but he didn't get any difficulty from the civilian ministries. And, according to Eichmann, he did what he never did before. That is, he drank alcohol, he drank cognac in front of other people. Heydrich never drank in front of anybody else. He lit up a cigar, took in the cognac, and told Eichmann, this is truly a victory for us. And indeed, several days later, he will tell other members of the SS, this is a great victory for us. One, the primacy of the SS has been established. The civilians in the ministry are going along. We've ironed out all of the difficulties, and we've established a policy and a principle of coordination. And indeed, in the aftermath, the stuff begins to shape up. Now all of the Jews, not some, all of the Jews that come out of Germany and are sent east are going to be shot. There is no diversity here anymore. It's not different in Riga from the way it is in Minsk. They're all going to be shot. Belzec's the camp is accelerated in its building. New extermination camps are built. Auschwitz is expanded. And indeed, lines are beginning to be drawn. Lines and preparations are beginning to be made for the deportation of the Jews from France, from Belgium, and the Netherlands. And indeed, again, arrangements are made with the indigenous police forces to make sure that the Jews are going to be deported. In short, everything that Heydrich had wanted he is going to get at the Vanze conference. What is the student of the Holocaust to make out of what happened at Vanze? And I will say this, not that I am the prophet from upstate New York, I am not. I will tell you I do not have a monopoly on the truth. I will suggest that the following is important, or the following things are important in terms of what happened at Vanze. Number one, you see how important ideology is. Here again, you don't have to buy into everything that Professor Goldhagen said. Goldhagen says they're all, the whole bunch of the German people are anti-Semites and wanted them dead. I will not go that far. But there is no question that those who say that the war against the Jews was a war conducted by the party and the SS, and only by the party and the SS, are dead wrong. The war against the Jews is made possible because large numbers of civilians in high-ranking and in low-ranking places have bought into that war against the Jews. And this is not following orders. This is not Hannah Arendt's banality of evil. These are people who are zealous anti-Semites and share the antipathy that the party has to the Jews and believe that is essential to, in fact, settle accounts with the Jews. Ideology is important. 
It is important in high levels. It is important in low levels. It is important in understanding the unfolding of the Holocaust that Nazi ideology penetrated into the hearts and minds of ordinary men and women, including people who are not so ordinary, people who had PhDs in law and PhDs in economics. The best example that I can give you of this is one that I may have repeated to you on another, I said to you on another occasion. It is the best example of the role of ideology that I have ever heard. In the period of the Holocaust, after the Von Zee Conference, after the Von Zee Conference, there is a German battalion, Battalion 101. It is a police battalion. It is composed of policemen in Hamburg, traffic cops, criminal detect detectives who search out crime. They are sent to Poland. They volunteer. They think they're going to be traffic policemen in Poland. They think they're going to say, do the same type of police work in Poland. No, their job in Poland is to kill Jews. And one of the men in the battalion is the battalion's physician. The physician is not a quack. He is a well-trained, bona fide German physician. His job, among other things, of course, is to take care of the German soldiers, but also to show them before an action where it is on the body of a, Ger of a Jewish woman who is holding a child, where they should shoot the woman so that the bullet goes simultaneously through her body and the child's, such as so as to economize on ammunition. When the war is over, the man is interrogated. And the interrogator succinctly puts what is the natural question, of course, is, you are a physician. You have been trained to save life. How could you do what you did? Listen to the answer that he gives. This is ideology talking. He says, I did exactly what I was trained to do. From the beginning of time, a battlefield surgeon has been taught that if a soldier is wounded in a limb and gangrene sets into the limb, the limb is amputated in order to save the body. Next sentence. The Jews are the gangrene of society. They had to be eliminated, and I did my part in eliminating them. So the first lesson that one can learn from the Von Zee Conference is the importance of ideology. A second lesson that one can learn from the Von Zee Conference is, at the risk of offending some of you, the uniqueness of the Jewish experience. We are going, Heydrich says, we are going to comb Europe from west to east for Jews. And we are going to kill them. That is what he is saying. In Jerusalem, Eichmann says, when Heydrich speaks in the formal speech, he uses euphemisms, disappear in treatment. When the meeting is over and I, Eichmann, stop taking minutes, we talk about murder, we talk about a dilation, we talk about extermination. And when Heydrich talks about murder, extermination, annihilation, and when he talks about combing Europe from west to east, he's talking about Jews. He's not talking about gypsies. He's not talking about homosexuals. He's not talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, please do not misconstrue what I am saying. I do not for a single moment mean to minimize the sufferings of those groups. Not for a single moment. Dead is dead, torture is torture, humiliation is humiliation, and suffering is suffering. But the fact of the matter is, the unique aspect of the Holocaust comes forth at Von Zee as it will come forth again and again. The only group in German-occupied Europe that is singled out for extermination, as Himmler puts it, down to the last child in the cradle, is European Jewry. The Jewish experience is unique. What would have happened after the war, that is anybody's guess. In all likelihood, God forbid, had the Germans won the Second World War, probably 10 to 15 million Poles would have been killed, and probably even more citizens of the Soviet Union would have been killed, 
and the population of both areas would have been reduced to a slave population. Himmler even writes about this. But there is no analog to the Wannsee Conference about Poles, about gypsies, about homosexuals, and about Jehovah's Witnesses. It is simply not there. You get a sense at Wannsee. If one didn't get it before, one sees it now. That is the unique experience of the Jews during the period of the Holocaust. When it is all wrapped up, I must tell you, this is, again, I hesitate to use this terminology, this is the German war effort at its most efficient. There will be problems in the unfolding of the final solution. There will be problems of turf. There will be problems, there will be personality conflicts. But in the end, six million Jews are going to die. Nearly every Jew that the Germans can get their hands on are going, is going to die. That is very, very efficient. And it appears all the more efficient when you contrast it with the relative inefficiency of the German war effort and Hitler's role as war leader. Succinctly put, Adolf Hitler was a lousy war leader. He did not understand the role of science and technology, and that's why those absolutely magnificent weapons, again, I hesitate to use the word, those great weapons that the Germans will have and use at the end of the Second World War are not used earlier. The Germans are the only ones to have jet aircraft. There's not a single Allied jet plane that goes up into the air in the Second World War. But the Germans have the jets, but the jets don't go up until the end of 1944 because Hitler will not allocate the resources to build them. And the best weapon, with the exception of the atomic bomb, but certainly the best weapon in the European theater, the weapon that to this day cannot be stopped, and that is in World War II, it is known as the V-2, the first ballistic missile. You only know when it's coming after it's hit. That, too, is on the drawing boards in 42 and in early 43, but it doesn't go into action until the second half of 44, because once again, Hitler doesn't understand the role of technology and science. And remember what I said to you when I talked to you about his behavior in Moscow? That's Hitler at his best. From then on, it's all downhill. He tells Rommel not to withdraw from El Alamein, and Rommel is beaten. He tells von Paulus, do not withdraw from Stalingrad, and the German Sixth Army is surrounded and destroyed at Stalingrad. He tells the German army to advance in the Battle of the Kursk Salient in the summer of 43, and German army is destroyed, and the German army will never again be on the offensive on the Eastern Front. Inexorably, the Red Army will roll on. In short, Von Zey demonstrates the zeal, the efficiency, the dedication of high-ranking members of the Third Reich to what they consider to be the most important aim of the war, and that is making Europe Judenrein, making Europe clean of Jews. Put another way, it is because of Von Zey, and it is because of, indeed, because of what is decided at Wannsee, because of Adolf Hitler's role here. For here is another thing that we learn. That is, Germans march towards their Fuhrer. That is, they march in his direction. It's an interesting statement made by a prominent Nazi in 1938 when he says to his followers, he says to his people, sometimes we must march towards the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer gives us a signal of what has to be done, we will march towards him. That's what happens in the Holocaust. But the ultimate lesson here is, of course, the role of personality in history. There are many Germans that want Jews dead. They are particularly prominent in the German elite. They have taken their signals from Adolf Hitler. But without a decision by Hitler, there is no murder of European Jewry a quintessential example of the role of personality in history. Hitler's role, marching towards the Fuhrer, the role of Wannsee, 
and what happens after Wannsee. This is going to be the war that Hitler won. Make no mistake, listen simply to the figures. There were 3,500,000 Jews in Poland in 1939. There are now less than 15,000. There were 180,000 Lithuanian Jews, there are 12,000. And I'm accounting for Soviet Jewish emigration, I'm accounting for the anti-Semitism. The numbers would be somewhat larger, but not all that larger. There are now 120,000 Jews in Hungary, the largest Jewish community in Central Europe. In 1939, there were 800,000. There were 800,000 Jews in Romania, even allowing for massive, massive uh, emigration to the state of Israel. There are still only 20,000 Jews in Romania. Hitler lost the war. The war against the Jews was won. And so I say to you, for anyone who is interested in understanding the Holocaust, you must become familiar with Wannsee. For anyone who wants to at least grasp at the possibility that maybe there won't be another Holocaust, that maybe there are lessons that we can learn from Vanze and what followed after Vanze that may help us prevent another Holocaust from taking place, again, I refer you to a study of the Holocaust in general and the Vanze Conference in particular. Succinctly put here is January 20th, 1942, the date of the Vanze Conference. January 21st of the year 2002, 60 years anniversary. Surely, my friends, this is an anniversary to remember. Thank you very much. have a few minutes for questions, so I would uh, urge you to um, raise your hand, stand up. Yes, please, Rhoda. It uh, is instructive in the context of your discussion that the villa in which the meeting took place had been requisitioned from a wealthy Jewish manufacturer in Vanze, who of course was deported. Yes. More than that, I cannot say. You are right. The villa was requisitioned. That's a nice word. We ought to not use the nice words here. <laughs> the Jew, it was stolen from the Jew, and the Jew was murdered. That's the way to put it. You are absolutely right. Yes. In that respect, you should also mention that Hitler interned in Norway and Poland. So he went to Poland, to Poland. And it was the gentleman is correct. Vanze is now a museum, and a very good museum, of the Holocaust. And for those of you that go to Berlin, this is certainly one of the places that you should visit. Thank you. Um, Judy. Uh, what do you think of the novel and then the movie that was made of it, Materland? I, I confess to you. Now I'm going to give you one of my confessions. I teach so many things. Very rarely, I shouldn't say this, some of you are going to walk out, oh my, what a disappointment. Very rarely do I read fiction. Very rarely do I read any fiction. I know, I know it is centered. I know, believe me, I know. And I know, and you'll never get a statement from me condemning fiction. I am not saying that. Again, don't walk out of here that you heard this hung dog prof say that you shouldn't read fictional literature. I am not saying that. I am saying that I teach such a variety of subjects that it is very difficult for me because of the proliferation of historical monographs to read, to read the fiction. Fiction can do certain things, again, that the historical monographs cannot do. 
There's a very good fictional account, again, of, uh, let us say, of, of Jews at Treblinka. And the writer, of course, deals with what the historian cannot deal with. What did people think when they went, with, just before they were killed at Treblinka? The literary person can do that. The historian cannot, unless he or she has that particular data. On the other hand, I am very wary of fiction in the Holocaust. I'll tell, you for, I'll tell you why. I always worry that my students, when they read even the best of historical fiction in the Holocaust, will say, but it's a novel. It didn't take place. I worry about that. I'm talking to the committed here. I'm talking to the knowledgeable here. Take it from me. And I am not being, if there are students here, again, don't misunderstand me. I am not being condescending. I'll put it in a more, let's say, a more attractive way. For those of you who teach here, you share with me the love of our profession. It's a wonderful, wonderful profession. It's good to be a professor. You deal with the community of the mind, and it's very nice. Your colleagues can drive you crazy on occasion, but they are basically decent and very bright people, and they discuss the things that you want to discuss. Now, I will speak for no one else. I'll only speak for myself. There's one bad thing about being a professor, especially a professor of history. Those damn kids are always between 17 and 22, and I grow older each year. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? It means, and if this, is, this is true of Jewish students, non-Jewish students, black students, white students. I always find it a little bit embarrassing when I talk about certain aspects of the modern period. Some of the black students never heard. They know of Martin Luther King Jr., but they don't know of anything else. The sit-ins in Greensboro? The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Or how about this question from a good student? Professor Burke, you've said, told us a lot of things and taught us a lot of things. There are many facts. You got to help me out in something. How can I help you? What is your question? Professor Burke, what side was Japan on in World War II? <laughs> when I was younger, had that question come to me, I would have gone off the wall. In my old age, I have begun to listen to my wife more, who tells me quite properly, be nice to the students. <laughs> so I don't give them a rough time. In fairness to them, it reminds me of the conversations that I used to have with my father. When my father would talk about how bad it was during the Depression. And I would say, so? <laughs> what did I know? He's talking about men selling apples on the street. He's talking about a relative who threw himself in front of the subway. It's before my time. For those of you who are Jewish and are committed, you see the problem we have in generating a sense of, let us say, feeling, both emotional and intellectual, for the state of Israel. It's not 1948 anymore. The Holocaust is long gone. So the problem here, again, why I don't to tie this in with why I don't use fiction. That basic minimum of knowledge that most adults, although most thinking adults who are concerned with this issue know about the Holocaust, is alien to many of our students. And I don't want any of them to say, this is not to say, there are, good, there are many courses, literature of the Holocaust, and not for a single moment am I saying anything bad about them. I'm just talking about my own preference. I want them 
to read the historical literature, and I want them to read the memoirs by people who lived, lived and died. So no one can say, I don't mean to spin this out, so no one can say that indeed, maybe it didn't take place like that. The question concerns the Evian Congre Congress or Conference, excuse me, of 1938, where, in fact, representatives of many, many countries, not only from Europe, not only from the United States, Canada, but people from uh, representing Latin American countries, came to Evian and said very nice things about the refugees, but in the final analysis, did not take anybody in. Now, again, you must never, never let explication become exoneration. There are always choices in history. I will tell you why they didn't do anything. One, it is a time of depression. Nobody wants immigrants in the country. Nobody. Nobody wants immigrants in their country in a time of depression. I will say something to you. If you were an American audience, it would resonate a little bit more. In the 1992 election, a standing president who six months before the election, or certainly nine months before the election, whose popularity was at its zenith, is defeated in the election by a governor from a small state with virtually no foreign policy experience whatsoever. In fact, nobody expected to beat the senior George Bush, and that's why in the end the only one left in the field is Bill Clinton. Now, <laughs> I'm trying to put this as, as delicately as I can here. The, again, the Evian con Conference, people do not want to do it, again, because of the Depression. What's this, what is the, the sign in Clinton's headquarters? An American would know it right away. It's the economy, stupid. The maximum unemployment rate during the senior President Bush's tenure as, presidency, as president was 7.9%. In 1931, at the depth of the Depression, the American unemployment rate is close to 27.5%. Nobody wants immigrants. That's number one. Nobody wants Jewish immigrants in particular because of pervasive anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a factor. You know that from your own country's history. Professor Abella has made that very, very clear. Nobody wants Jewish immigrants. And finally, if you want to be fair, and this is really an important point I suggest to you, nobody knows at Evian in 1938 that it's all gonna go, it's all gonna end by Jews going up the chimney in Auschwitz. Nobody knows that. Remember, the dullest student of history in this room, if you think history is, I'll use the Yiddish expression, a bubamaitza, if you think it's all, the other Yiddish word, it's all nourishkeit, it's all foolishness, remember. The dullest student here, this is January 21st of the year 2002, has an enormous advantage over the most brilliant statesman or stateswoman on January 6th of 1942. You know what happened on January 7th of 42. You know what happened at Vanze. If you're there on January 6th of 42, you don't know what's going to happen. Nobody in his wildest dreams, if you ever get to Auschwitz, I tell people every Jew once in his life or her life must go to Israel. Once in his or her life, every Jew must go to Israel. Every human being should walk through Auschwitz. When you get to Auschwitz II, to Birkenau, you walk along that track. In the middle of that track is what is called the Rampa. The Jews came off the trains, 
They were met by the Canada detail. That's the most privileged detail, incidentally, in Auschwitz. It's called the Canada detail because these people have access to food and Canada is believed by the people in Eastern Europe to be a cornucopia of all good things. They're met by the Canada detail. And who would have dreamt from the time the Jew gets off of a train to the time he or she goes up the chimney is an hour and a half. That's all it is. And at its zenith in the summer of 44, it's 20,000 Jews per day, day after day, gassed and cremated. This is the Holocaust at high tide, the killing of Hungarian Jewry. Nobody knows this at Evian. Nobody knows this at Evian. That's being fair. Anti-Semitism is also there. The depression is there. You cannot condemn any one country. Everybody is the same thing. To show you how difficult it is and how pervasive anti-Semitism is, in the middle of the 1930s, the Vatican, the Vatican approaches the government of Argentina and Brazil, the governments of Argentina and Brazil, particularly Brazil, and asks the government of Brazil to take in 3,000 Jews who are no longer Jews. These are 3,000 Jewish converts to Roman Catholicism. The Brazilian government refuses to take them in on the grounds that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew, and they're going to die. They're going to die. So the Evian Conference does contribute, number one, because it means that most Jews are not going to find a place of refuge. And number two, it probably does convince Adolf Hitler that the world will not be terribly concerned. And most important of all here is, if Hitler ever did in fact flirt with the idea of large-scale emigration of Jews to somewhere else, the behavior of the countries at Evian demonstrated to him that there really was no possibility of massive Jewish emigration from Europe. So the answer to your question is, yes, it is important. If you have time for uh, one more question, yes. Um, Professor Bush, um, what is your opinion of people who make a distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? That is a very good question, and I will repeat it. What do I make of people who make a distinction, or who make a distinction yes. between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? You can be an anti-Zionist, and you cannot be an anti-Semite. That you can be. My own gut feeling, however, is that many, if not most, of the anti-Zionists are also anti-Semites. And why do I say that? It is the vituperative nature of the attack upon Israel. It is the blaming of Israel for virtually everything no concern for the loss of Jewish lives or Israeli lives, and nearly absolute concern for the lives of Palestinians. The inability of many anti-Zionists to see any good in the state of Israel, any good whatsoever, leads me to believe, I, th I shouldn't have said most, many of the people who are anti-Zionist are indeed anti-Semites. And when given the, let us say, given the rope to hang themselves, in a sense, when they go on and on and on, one sees statements that are very, very close to being anti-Semitic, if not anti-Semitic. Now, again, do not misunderstand me. The great Rabbi Cook the Orthodox rabbi who was so benevolent towards secular Jews may used to make or made a very famous remark that an idea when it is created in heaven, something happens to it when it comes down to earth. <laughs> Zionism was and is a wonderful idea. The right of the Jewish people to have a homeland. The idea, and some of you may be surprised to hear this, Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, said, once we have settled the problems of the Jews, 
we will now move to settle the problems of the other great oppressed people in the world, the Negro. Zionism is not racist. Zionism is not anti-Arab. Zionism simply states that there is a place for the Jews. That place is what in Hebrew would be called Eretz Yisrael. Nonetheless, Rabbi Cook is right. Not every Jew is a tzaddik or a righteous man. Not every Israeli action is a good action. The Israelis are flesh and blood, and they have made some very, very serious mistakes. To point out those mistakes does not mean that one is an anti-Semite. To say that the country is, however, born in original sin, has no right to exist, to praise those who kill Jews in Israel, that is close to being an anti-Semite. OK, one more question. Yes. All right. The question is a very burning question concerning the Holocaust, and that is why the Allies did not bomb the railroad lines leading to Auschwitz. Now, I will do this as quickly as is humanly possible, but you've got to be careful. You've got to hang on to what I say, please. Number one, I don't mean to shock you, I am among those that believe that even if the railroad lines were bombed, it would not have altered the outcome very, very much. What our parents told us when we were children applies not only to children and not only to good things, but to bad things as well. I just spoke to you for almost an hour about the Wannsee Conference and about Nazi anti-Semitism and Hitler's anti-Semitism. Do you think for a single moment that because the Allies bombed the railroad lines leading to Auschwitz, that the Germans would not have found a way to murder Jews? What did our parents tell us? Where there's a will, there's a way. The Germans killed two million Jews by shooting them at Babi Yar, at Rambuli, and a whole host of places those Einsatzgruppen murdered the Jews the Nazis would have found a way to murder most Jews. Second point, again, the Talmud is right. You cannot judge another man unless you have stood in his shoes. You're in the War Department in Washington, and Jewish representatives approach you, bomb the railroad lines to Auschwitz. And then you say to yourself, as everybody knows, even now, with laser bombs and smart bombs, there is no real accuracy in strategic bombing. If we bomb the railroad lines or the crematory and the gas chambers, as was asked of the War Department, we are going to kill the inmates of the camps. It is true that the inmates of the camps, because we've heard this time and again, are praying that the Allies will bomb the camps, because at least the crematoria will be destroyed, the gas chamber will be destroyed, and at least Germans will be killed. But if you're sitting in Washington or London, the prospect of killing the inmates of the camps with your own bombs is not such an easy one to contemplate. Now, there is sheer anti-Semitism here on the part of some people, particularly in the British government. And there is also, believe it or not, the failure to believe that what is taking place in Auschwitz is mass murder. There are people who actually, as late as the summer and autumn of 1944, do not believe it is taking place. And finally, again, how can I say this? I am not a veteran. I certainly am not a combat veteran. You never get something for nothing 
if you bomb the railroad lines to Auschwitz and you bomb Auschwitz, you will pay a price. Somebody's going to die. Sometimes it may be, again, people are not told, only now are they told. We will lose thousands of men, and I suspect hundreds if not thousands of Canadian soldiers die in the Second World War, not in combat, but by accidents. A B-17, a Liberator, a Lancaster takes off. Sometimes it crashes. German anti-aircraft fire is fairly effective. How do you justify when air losses are so high to begin with? The British lose 600,000 men in the Second World War. 10% of all British dead are in bomber command. The British people are not told that during the war. 60,000 men, pilots and crews, are killed during the Second World War. How do you justify, if you are a military commander, the use and the possible loss of men and materiel for what is a purpose not related to the war effort? I'm not saying it shouldn't have been done. I myself believe it should have been done for humanitarian purposes. And I believe that some Jews would have been saved. I'm not contradicting myself. I'm trying to explain to you, number one, that no matter what was done, the overwhelming majority of Jews would have died. But since we are talking about human beings and not cattle, if you could have saved 50 or 60,000, then it was worth the price, I would say. But again, how do you justify military losses for, let us say, humanitarian reasons? I'm not sure there's any government in the world at any time. Or again, I'll put it another way to you. I'll give you two examples. Again, they would resonate more with an American audience, but I'm sure it, it will resonate here as well. Because of 22 American dead in Somalia, the United States will perform an act of shame. An act of shame, incidentally, which Canada participates in as well. To an American audience, I would say that 20 years from now, 20 years from now, when the history of the Clinton administration is written, what is the great moral failing of Bill Clinton? Not Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> Not that modern day Hadassah, as some Orthodox rabbis have said. No. The great shame of your country and of my country and of the French in particular and the British is that when close to 800,000 Rwandans were hacked to death, we did not lift a finger in their defense. And it was not racism that led us to do that. It was we didn't want to risk our own blood. I am not denying what you say, and I do please, I am not ridiculing what you say. Your question is one of the great legitimate questions of the Holocaust. I'm just trying to tell you that there are many ways of looking at that. But I must tell you, since it is in the Jewish tradition, never to end, never to end on a negative note. We are always optimists. The world can be collapsing. We can read, for those of you that go to the synagogue, haftorahs or prophets that talk to us about fire and brimstone. The word Jeremiad has a real meaning to it. But in the last paragraph, the good things are going to happen. So what? Maybe we have indeed learned something. Not as much as we should have, but we've learned something. We stopped the slaughter in Kosovo. That we did. We have moved in other parts of the world. And even in Afghanistan, your country will join with my country, not only in defeating the Taliban, but in trying to restructure the country so something like that doesn't happen again. The problem always is in a democracy, that's the real problems of democracy, is that we very often do not act until it's one minute to midnight. Thank you all very much.
what Professor Diamond was referring to is um, uh, a chazaka, which means that um, once something has happened s three times, it is a permanent feature of, uh, of, uh, of your life. So I would like to make Professor Burke a permanent feature of Waterloo's life. In Israel, when you meet somebody for three times, you're supposed to buy them ice cream. Oh, I, I bought them dinner. <laughs> um, Very yeah. good dinner it was. <laughs> I'd like now to call on um, Professor Brian Hendley, the former Dean of the Faculty of Arts, to thank our speaker. Brian? Very briefly. One of the perennial problems in Western thought is the problem of evil. Uh, thinkers have puzzled for many years on how a good God can allow evil to occur. We seek to explain it. We seek to cope with it. We want to try to understand it. We want to pre prevent it from happening again. And certainly in the case of the Holocaust, as we've heard tonight, there are different attempts to come to grips with it. There's an attempt to stress the banality of it, mindless functionaries only following orders. There's an attempt to look at the leaders and many of the people responsible as psychologically disturbed zealots. Perhaps even more worrying for people like us is the role of intellectuals in furthering this evil. There have been a lot of studies of Albert Speer, highly cultured, fascinated by Hitler, unable to let him go. There's a book that came out in 1946 called Hitler's Professors, which is a shameful listing of relatively average professors jumping on side of the Nazis. And as was pointed out tonight, eight of 15 at this conference, PhDs. How should the academic community respond to evil? Doing what we do best, get the facts, refute the errors, carry on the tradition, teach the culture, don't let them win. So I think it's very appropriate on the 60th anniversary of the Vanze Conference that we've brought in a distinguished historian to help us understand the horror and the evil. And on your behalf, I want to thank Professor Burke for leading us all through our own concrete act of remembrance. Thank you very much.